8 a.m. October 4th, 1970. Pitt's crews make final adjustments to the mechanical thoroughbreds entrusted to their care for the Hardy Ferodo 500 over Bathurst's rugged 3.78 miles Mount Panorama circuit. Five classes determined by price are represented in the maximum number of 60 starters, which includes three of ten reserves. As was the case last year, it's highly probable outright honours will be fiercely contested by the highly skilled Ford factory team entries under Al Turner's direction and Harry Firth's Holden dealer team, which took out the event last year. Bruce McPhee, driving a Ford team car for the first time, gains number two grid position, clocking seven-tenths of a second slower than teammate Alan Moffat's record figures of two minutes 49.3. The Holland Little XU1 qualifies fifth. The West Brown Pacer, fastest of the Valiant qualifiers, occupies 11th position. Seaton and Gibson's GTHO clocks third best to give Ford the first three grid positions. Cook and Selden's Holden, one of 12 XU1s in the event, the fastest of which was Colin Bonds at two minutes 54 seconds. His car gets some attractive assistance to number four grid spot. Extending down Pitt Strait and into the bottom of Conrod, this year's grid starts cars two abreast as an added safety measure. Last year's winner, Bond, elects to drive single-handed this year. But Barry Seaton teams up with Fred Gibson. It's the first time competitors have the option to drive as a team or on their own. Alan Moffat decides to go it alone in the number one Ford works entry. Bob Beasley and Bob Muir are together in a Falcon GTHO, 14 of which are in the race. It'll be some hours before Des West sees a girl again, so he bids a Castrol Bell a fond farewell. But not even beautiful girls can disturb Moffat's concentration. Bond is a little more receptive. For the reliable McPhee, 1968 winner and second in 1969, what does 70 hold? Taking advantage of the pole position, Moffat leads up Mountain Straight with Bond skillfully manoeuvring into second place ahead of Seaton and McPhee. Speculation about Ford's tactics is rife. There are those who feel Moffat will attempt to break up the field, especially as he's backed up by McPhee and Seaton. But the majority are convinced he'll drive only as fast as the dictates of the race demand. However, the Toranas have proved pacey in practice, so they're certain to keep the GTHOs honest. An official pre-race warning was given to all competitors to drive with caution in the early stages. Last year, due to some drivers pushing too hard, lap one had a shattering opening, which nearly stopped the race. Bill Brown's car flipped and became airborne when only a few cars had gone through. In the worst traffic jam the race has known, 15 cars banked up, ruining the prospects of all those involved. But that was last year. Today, all heed the warning. Through Forrest's elbow, Moffat leads Seaton, who's taken over second spot from Bond with McPhee next. Then comes Beasley with Brock, second best placed of the XU1s. Flashing down Conrad for the first time, Moffat is trailed by Seaton and Bond. In the braking area, Bond pulls out to easily gather in Moffat and Seaton and takes the lead as he negotiates the left-hander into pit straight. Sensing a battle in the David Goliath mold, the huge crowd acclaims Bond as he speeds past the pits, his XU1 going perfectly. But Moffat and Seaton use a little more thrust to keep him within reach as they again head up the mountain.
Don's confidence is obvious, and it seems he's endeavouring to force his more powerful pursuers to push their cars harder than was their intention in the settling down period. experienced as a rally driver, Bond appreciates the need to nurse a car in such a gruelling event. But already he's pushing hard, hoping Moffat will do the same. Uh, it was interesting to see what uh, they could do. I was aware that if anybody was going to do it, Colin Bond was going to put up a show. And I also thought knowing how the old Fox operates, he was uh, trying to suck me along a little bit. And uh, I figured, well, I'll, I'll let him go. With drivers and cars at their peak, the anticipated thrills of a full-blooded Holden Ford battle are materializing. Bernie Hanley spins his Mazda, but no damage is done. Recovering, he sets out to make up lost ground in Class A for cars costing up to $1,960. In this group, John Roxburgh's Datsun is prominent. Graham Moore's Torana and Bruce Stewart's Datsun are among the leaders in Class B. After five laps, Moffat regains the overall lead. Resisting Bond's challenge to an early duel, Moffat instead concentrates on pre-race set speeds. An ambulance joins the field on the climb up the mountain in response to an emergency call. At McPhillamy Park Corner, while travelling in the vicinity of 90 miles an hour, John Kieran's Torana smashes into the fencing after blowing a tyre. Kieran's leg is broken and he's treated with oxygen as ambulance men place the injured limb in a splint. Today was Kieran's initial start in a Bathurst 500 and his first motor race for about four years. temperatures test the fitness and endurance of all drivers. From the outset, Don Smith's Datsun has led Class B with teammate Bruce Stewart not far behind. In Class D, high hopes are held for Norm Beachy's four-barrel pacer, particularly by Norm. And my co-driver Bruce Hindon, he's a very capable, uh, experienced driver. He's out there. We may not look very, very clever for the first four, four and a half hours, but we're hoping to look a, a little bit uh, smarter when we get down to around about the uh, last day out to an hour and a half. But Norm didn't even get a chance to drive. Timing gear failure brings about the Pacers' early retirement. <laughs> Moffat is going along smoothly in the lead, still pursued by Bond. Lap times are slower than those set in practice, but should it be necessary, there seems little doubt Moffat could easily find additional speed. <laughs> Lapping several of the smaller cars, Moffat artistically conserves the Falcon's power. Winning a Bathurst 500 ranks high among Moffat's ambitions, and he has a chance of achieving this today. But there's still a long way to go. Prepared to go along steadily now, but poised to take advantage of any opportunity, Bond is second overall. The Datsuns of Tapsol, Leighton, Kennedy and Slattery are going well in the 15-strong A-class, comprising four different makes of vehicle. Overall speeds may not be very much in advance of recent 500s, cars today are travelling faster up the mountain than those a few years ago came down. The installation of Armco fencing at various points is hailed by drivers as a marked improvement, and the track surface has never been better. After, at one stage, holding down third place overall, David Mackay pits with troubles. It's very nice out there, and the car is going, going well, but... Um... I rather feel that the pressure was falling away a little, so rather than uh, uh, risk uh, somewhat expensive damage, it was better to come in. 
maintaining the form that took him to success in the Tasman series at Warwick Farm and the Sandown 3R race prior to Bathurst, Moffat's control and handling is giving him scope to virtually dominate the 500. Even at such an early stage, it seems only bad luck could rob him of victory. Especially as it's now obvious McPhee is splendidly playing the role of backup driver. Seaton is still prominently placed, but his car appears to be less potent than before. Moffat continues on stylishly, but Sheldon has crashed at XL Bend. His Monaro GTS was the only one in the event. Bond makes an unscheduled pit stop due to carburetor trouble. Meanwhile, the Brock Morris XU1 moves into second place. With such a solid pace being set, Bond faces an extremely difficult task. Nevertheless, he's determined not to push his car beyond its limit. We've got to look after the car because we cannot get the thing serviced in any stage of the game, or at only after 500 miles. You've just got to take uh, a little bit of care when changing gears, putting the brakes on, and just everything in general. You can sort of think first of the car, I think, and then winning the race after that. Going along consistently in their respective classes are Samson's Corolla and Stewart's Datsun. His lights burning, Bob Holden is going well. So too is the third-placed McPhee driving a typically patient race. A blowout brings Brian Reed to the pits. He's followed in by Don Holland, making a bid to lead Class C and to get within challenging range of the overall lead. Excitement surrounds Moffat's first scheduled pit stop after 45 laps. As new tyres are being fitted on the GTHO and fuel replenished by a well-drilled pit crew, Des West's four-barrel pacer flashes past to take over the lead. But Alterna is unperturbed. We've made our first stop and uh, it was Bruce McPhee and it took two minutes and nine seconds to change three tires and we put in 25 gallons of fuel. We've got Moffat fueled up again with four tires and, and 25 gallons and they're both out now. And uh, we'll just have to see how it goes. Overcoming the consequences of some indifferent laps, last year's co-winner, Tony Roberts, lapped some of the smaller class cars whilst improving his position. Des West still holds outright lead. comes in and hands the wheel over to 21 years old Bob Morris competing in his third 500. The Holdens are pulling in fairly regularly now, ominous signs for the XU1s. Seaton is also in bother. I just went all of a sudden, the last one, I blew a um, tyre went down coming down the straight the first time, but uh, the diff just backed up coming out of Murray Corner there, just went all of a sudden. It didn't take that long to change the diff, it was pretty senseless trying to get on. Al Turner is naturally concerned as the car leaves the track, but he still has two strong hands in Moffat and McPhee. The West Brown Valiant pits for a scheduled stop and loses the lead. In fact, time consumed during the stop puts the pacer back into pit place overall, but it still holds a comfortable class lead. Fall and go. 
laughs. XU1 spins, sweeping out of the S's. But it's OK and continues on as one of its class leaders. up lost time improving several places to be in the first 10 but is again forced into the pits this time with foul trouble <laughs> to clear the pit area the XU1 is taken off the track putting Bond virtually out of the race McPhee is now second with West a lap behind in fourth place Morris comes in with similar symptoms to those of Bond's car. The car is in need of major repair, but Firth retains his composure. Oh, we're pretty happy about it, actually. We, we had a little screw drop out, which dropped our first car back a bit, but uh, he's since picked up a bit, and the other chap uh, is running very well. We had a pretty quick pit stop with him. There's a lot of other cars have fallen out and had trouble. The race is, you know, still not even half over. a tire at Forest Elbow, the Knight Ritter car is badly buckled, but Knight is uninjured. Resuming after a pit stop, Holland heads Class C and joins McVie in a struggle for second overall. Christine Cole's Sandra Bennett car has a troublesome front tyre, but it's not serious enough to put them out of the running for the ladies' trophy. Robert sustains an exciting charge, the GTHO housing a replacement engine, which time prevents being properly tuned or balanced. the Gross Brothers' hopes in Class C at Forest Elbow. But the tenacious Colin Bond is determined to improve his position in Class C. Well, this year we're driving a smaller car, and we will be able to drive the car practically flat out the whole way because the brakes are good, the tyre wear will be good, um, and the car itself, uh, we can't over-rev it with the hydraulic lifters, it'll only do 6.4. Um, so really, this year we can drive the car a lot faster. When I say faster, we can drive it harder than we have previously when we've really had to look after the car. The going is not only tough and hot on the drivers, but spectators as well. Firmly entrenched as leader, Moffat is well in command, while McPhee holds a backup position in second place. Bond's Holden is going well again, but he's many laps behind. There's an atmosphere of calm confidence in the Ford camp. Their pit crew has been by far the fastest during stops, and Moffat is capitalising on time saved. <laughs> Needing only two wheels to negotiate Forest Elbow, class leader Tapsell's Datsun recovers to hold its advantage. Roxburgh's Datsun locks a brake and has a brush in the depot. in conserving his vehicle, McPhee comes in for a final pit stop. He's proving his theories as to the most important aspects of the 500. Particularly in long distance events, since this particular 500 here at Bathurst, the brakes, it's, it's won or lost on brakes because uh, without them you can have the most powerful motor in the world and, you, and you, you're not with it. Uh, next, uh, I would say tyres, 
and then of course the reliability of the motor mechanical. Doug Chibber's pacer is making leeway on the overall leaders and barring accidents should be up there at the finish. Holland has to make another pit stop so that Chivers could then take over the lead in Class C, in which there's been only two retirements. Third placed overall, Holland pits. With some 30 laps to go, he changes to the new 350 faster compound Dunlop tyres, and these in fact improve his lap times by about three seconds. Moffat has more than a lap advantage over Holland, so the XU1 faces an impossible task. Tapsell and Leighton still lead Class A. Roberts is improving his position and is in the same lap as the leader. Leo Gagan is improving in his class. Smith and Taylor retain the Class B lead, while Garth and Hall battle Gagan for third position in Class C. The unruffled Moffat still restrains his mount, his fastest lap 2.55, being more than five seconds slower than his qualifying figures. The slow motion camera dramatically illustrates the skillful handling of the semi-flying cars through the S's. Lapping practically the whole field, Moffat's lead over McPhee has been narrowed as the Fords continue their dominance. Leader at one stage during the morning, West is now ninth overall. Moffat is right on schedule for his final pit stop during which the crew makes their fastest turnaround. They've taken no longer than 2 minutes 45 on any stop, but this one with fuel and four tyres is only 2 minutes 9 seconds. With speed still in excess of 120 miles per hour being reached down Conrad, Moffat continues nursing the GTHO along, not taking any unnecessary risks with the race in his keeping. is cruising less than half a minute ahead of McPhee as the race reaches its closing status. Roberts recaptures third place from Chivers with some attacking driving. But almost immediately after going over Skyline, Roberts' car spins and crashes backwards down a steep slope. Officials and spectators rush down to render assistance, but although the car is a write-off, fortunately Roberts is only dazed. Moffat rounds Forrest Elbow and heads for Conrod Strait for the last time. He leads McPhee and goes on to win from his teammate with Don Holland third, a lap behind. Ford's manager Al Turner gives credit to all in the Ford team. They drove exactly the way we wished them to drive. It's a team effort, it's been a team effort all the way through, and we're very proud of the results. But I, I, I must say this, I think it's firstly a, a, a credit to our product to do this, and secondly, to the fine group of fellows that work for me. I've got a tremendous group of young fellows, and they've worked hard, and they've done a tremendous job here in the pits today, and I just can't say too much for them. Audi Ferrodo General Manager George Hibbert presents the victor's laurel wreath and outright winner's pluck to a triumphant Moffat, following his marathon six hours, 34 minutes, 26 seconds at the wheel, beginning his racing career in Victoria and later continuing in Canada and the United States. Moffat returned to Australia early last year to become quickly established as a top driver and master strategist. <laughs>